Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Schoen's new book, Red Milk, translated from the Icelandic by Victoria Cribb. Schoen is easily one of my favorite authors working today. So when this book came out about a month ago in the UK, and it was announced it wasn't coming out in the US until September, I had to order it from an independent bookseller and get it shipped over here. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Schoen's work, I'll give a little bit of background on him and his writing, but I'm actually preparing a sort of author spotlight um, to go more deeply into um, his background as well as all of his works. But for now, Schoen is an Icelandic novelist, poet, songwriter, basically all around creative. He's perhaps most famously known for collaborating a lot with the incomparable pop star Björk. These collaborations even earned him a nomination for an Academy Award for the songs in Lars von Trier's movie uh, uh, Dancers in the Dark, or Dancer in the Dark. His work with Björk is, is great, seriously. Go read some of the lyrics of some of the songs that he's co-written with her. They're both quite the poets. Uh, but where Schoen has, for the past 20 years or so, really shown, if you'll pardon the phonetic pun, is in his novels. Again, in my author spotlight video, I'll go over all of them, but for now, Let's turn to his latest, Red Milk. Red Milk is an autopsy of this historical young man named Gunnar Kampen, um, who created and led an underground neo-Nazi group in Iceland in the 1950s and 1960s. And autopsy is definitely the right word for this book, as it opens with Gunnar lying dead on a train um, in, in, in England. What this book really is, is an exploration of what makes ordinary people mostly young men, turn to extremist ideologies like Nazism. But what's really interesting here is where Schoen locates this reactionary political movement of these people, because it isn't necessarily in the esoteric, or the sort of pull um, from ideals of mythic heritage, nor is it necessarily in the stupidity and gullibility of these people that we often associate with the sort of people who get pulled into these odious movements. But instead, he locates this political movement to the far right in the ordinary and in the banal. That is, as he says in the afterword to this book, a Nazi or a neo-Nazi is not any more special than the most ordinary of us. It's pretty clear that Schoen is heavily influenced uh, by Hannah Arendt's idea of the banality of evil, which she explored in her book Eichmann in Jerusalem. In that book, Arendt basically argues that Adolf Eichmann, the organizer of the final solution, the genocide of Jews and others during the Holocaust, wasn't driven by some sort of radical fanaticism or anything like that, but instead was driven by a bunch of small banal things, like just wanting to be a part of a bigger group. Famously, Eichmann's defense at Nuremberg was simply that he was just, quote, doing his job. Arendt's thesis is much more complicated than this very quick summary, but what's important here is what Arendt showed and what Schoen effectively explores in this book is how these people get sucked into these reprehensible belief systems are often, whatever you may think of them, individual boring people who could have just as easily been sucked into a sports fandom or another cult or an art movement or anything else really. Now this is obviously a really nuanced idea that a lot of people, especially in our modern political climate, might not like. And I totally understand that. I love the Jojo Rabbit's relentless and mocking parody of the insanely contradictory philosophy, if you could even call it that, of the far right. And I do think that rhetorically speaking, works like Jojo Rabbit are sometimes effective at deconverting these people who like to think that their facts and logic uh, over feelings type of people. But I think what Arendt and Schoen really explore is, at the end of the day, a more sympathetic look at the individual while still maintaining a highly, highly combative stance against the ideology that sucked them in. And I think, again, rhetorically speaking, this might be a more effective way of dealing with the individuals within that I ideology. Now, I know I haven't really talked about the book uh, yet, um, but I did want to talk a bit about this connection between Norse mythology and Nazism, which this book touches on, as this is something that I've actually given some papers on. Um, and I don't say this necessarily to give myself an air of superiority or credence even, really. Um, I just say to illustrate that I've read a lot about this um, and I'm really interested in it and I've thought a lot about it. There is this 
undeniably strong connection between the sort of Nordic, Germanic, Northern mythos and ethos that many Nazis, going back to Richard Wagner, um, drew, uh, drew on, and which get tied into ideas of whiteness and purity, um, never mind things like nationalism. That is, many Nazis, including Hitler himself, drew inspiration uh, for their ideas of an Aryan race on this sort of pan-Germanic ethos that is, for them, embodied in the literature of Norse mythology and other historical legendary literature from the Middle Ages, which happens to be my area of expertise. Hitler loved the operas of Wagner, and what Wagner was drawing on was medieval literature, like the Middle High German Nibelungenlied, um, or the Old Norse Versunga Saga, um, among others. And it pains me to say this, but even today, if you're looking for neo-Nazis online, your best bet is to look for people who are online talking about this Nordic or Germanic heritage, and often with Thor and Odin tattoos on their body. Obviously, as someone who literally has a statue of Odin right behind him, um, I'm not saying that uh, all Norse enthusiasts are, are Nazis or even close to that. In fact, their, their takeaway from these myths on issues like gender and other things it, are always odd because it makes me wonder if we've even read the same stories as they always seem to forget the you know famous story of Thor cross-dressing uh, cross into a wedding dress in the poem Thrinskvita or Loki transforming into a woman and being referred to in gender-neutral pronouns, by the way, um, in that very same poem. And this is all much more complicated, obviously, than I'm making it out to be, but I'm trying to be as concise as possible. Um, if this is of interest, perhaps I, I can make a longer video on this connection. As again, this is something that I'm, I'm very interested in as someone who studies Old Norse language and literature. But this is all to say that Nordic people and people who associate their own identities with this sort of heritage are often somewhat more susceptible to this bastardization because their culture and national identity is often inseparably connected to this mythology and this mythos. But back to Schoen, what he does, interestingly, is, well, for the most part, ignore all of that, <laughs> which really begs the question, why did I just say all of that? Um, how are you going to dig yourself out of this one? Good question. I'll explain it quite simply by saying that transitions are difficult. Red Milk, like most of Schoen's books, is extremely short, and we don't really get any interiority. We don't really get into Gunnar's head. Um, we don't ever see his thought process, really, especially in, this, in the first section of the book, which is focused on his quite ordinary childhood. That being said, the second part of the book is epistolary. It's made up of a bunch of letters that he writes as a young man to all these famous Nazis all around the world, whom I don't really care enough to name, though they're all real historical people. Um, as Gunnar is desperately trying to find connections with people internationally. And I found this second section, the one that's made up of all these letters, to be the most interesting, as it's when Gunnar is at his most relatable. And in fact, Schoen speaks about this in the afterword of this book, when he, he talks about how when he, Schoen, was a late teen, early adult, he was writing all of these letters to all these surrealist poets and artists all around the world, as he was desperately trying to connect with them to show him his work and ask, ask them questions and stuff like that. I think it's in this section that Schoen most effectively explores the psychology of alienation that leads to these young people basically casting out their lines and hoping that something takes hold on the other end to pull them in. This is clearly relevant today, as we know that most young people who get drawn into these belief systems um, do so via the internet where they're so easily grabbed onto and drawn in. The sense of feeling special and belonging is always way more powerful than any sort of rationality. Gunnar opens an Icelandic neo-Nazi chapter as a late teenager and eventually creates a newspaper called the New Mjotnir, um, which is where we see some of this Norse mythology being transferred to the present, as this paper is named after Thor's hammer, Mjotnir. Why didn't I use that to transition? I guess I kind of lied earlier when I said that Schoen isn't interested in this connection at all. He is. He more just doesn't want to focus on it primarily, as he believes that that isn't the primary draw to these belief systems. 
There are some hints in this book about the connection between Nazism and Norse mythology. Um, we see early on uh, Gunnar talking to a French woman who is only learning Icelandic as she's sort of flirting with Nazi ideologies and wants to be able to read the uh, Icelandic sagas um, in their original language. Further, we see this guy named Luther who introduces Gunnar to these beliefs, who owns a bicycle shed called Sleipnir, uh, which is the name of Odin's uh, famous eight-legged horse whom Loki gave birth to. It's a long story. Um, but in this shed, Luther um, teaches German and probably, though it's not exactly clear, also probably teaches some Nazi ideologies. So this book is exploring this problem, um, but Schoen very consciously chooses not to focus on it, as he's much more interested in the banality of Nazism. We see throughout this book Gunnar's uh, very sophistic logic, which is a mainstay of far right-wing thought. Further, Gunnar and his group are much more interested in what we would call the so-called culture war than anything actually material. We see both of these ideas at one point expressed, and the text reads, Ever since the founding of the sovereign power movement, there had been a consensus among the members of the executive committee that they would not prioritize the fight against uh, domestic Jews. They had, they had enough on their plate in combating the intellectual Jews who threatened the freedom of ordinary Icelanders from the right and left, Marxists and capitalists, as well as those such as avant-gardists and jazz musicians who committed atrocities against the nation's cultural heritage. The Jewish question was complicated in Iceland. Gunnar had discussed it with laymen and experts, both indirectly and openly. As far as he could discover, purebred Jews had played almost no part in the history of Iceland over the centuries. However, many of those with whom he had discussed the subject suspected that a number of the Danish merchants, who for 200 years had sucked the lifeblood out of the impoverished smaller nation, fobbing them off with rotten foodstuffs crawling with maggots, had in fact been Jews who had, been, who had acquired their license to trade as a result of their conversion to Christianity. This was hard to prove without, com without combing the archives of the Royal Library in Copenhagen, and as yet, no one had undertaken this research. But it could hardly be a coincidence that the adjective Jewish has signified miserly. The Icelanders' only other acquaintance with the true nature of the race was through the beloved Hymns of Passion, which gave a clear account of their deceitfulness and malice. This book provides an interesting look at what draws people to Nazi ideologies while maintaining a certain distance from these people. Again, this isn't really a probing psychological book about the mysteries of this process, but instead an exploration of the banality of this process, the ordinariness of this process. Gunnar Kampen isn't unique in his family, nor is he unique in Iceland. He's just an ordinary guy who got sucked down an extremist rabbit hole. Importantly, I think, we're never asked to sympathize with Gunnar. Indeed, Schoen avoids this problem completely, as the very first time that we meet Gunnar on the first page of the novel, he's already dead. But we are asked to try to understand him, and I think that that project is actually really important right now. I think what this book shows is that sometimes the neo-Nazis are drawn in by this fabricated and completely bastardized notion of a Germanic or Nordic ethos reliant on misreading the literature that I love. And other times, like in Gunnar Kempen's case, they're drawn in for the most banal reasons, and they very well could have been drawn into a knitting hobby or a book club or something like that. This review was a bit more rambly than usual, um, because this is a topic that politically I'm clearly interested in, um, but academically as well, I'm sort of unfortunately inextricably connected to um, this topic, as my field of study, Old Norse language and literature, is always under threat of being appropriated by the far right. So I, I hope it's okay. Red Milk is a great little read though. As always, Schoen puts so much into such few words. He's always sort of writing these epics in miniature. And Red Milk is incredibly thought-provoking and particularly timely, I think. Let me know what you think. Um, like I said, uh, I'm working on an author spotlight on Schoen, so I hope hopefully that will be of interest as well. Um, but for now, thanks for watching. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's not even going to be funny.